Hampshire College astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe. Years and years ago on my first show, On the River, I was talking about astronomy and my love of amateur astronomy. Not a science that I was into as a child, but I read A Brief History of Time, and it changed my whole perspective on science and science education and opened up my mind in a way that has been really exciting over these last few decades. And I said something wrong or stupid on the radio about the world of outer space, and you reached out to me and said, hey, I'm an astronomer from Hampshire College. You got that wrong. And I said, let's get together and talk about astronomy for the radio. And that forged a nearly two decades long conversation about astronomy. And we're here at your kitchen table in Amherst, surrounded by beautiful photos of the rings of Saturn and the surface of the moon. Mars. And Oh, yes, sorry. That's <laughs> see, Mars. There you go. That's a correction. See, <laughs> I, my first mistake already on the new show. It's red. I should have known it was Mars. Um, this I would love these conversations to continue because what you do so well is you are a science educator. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about, specifically in regards to astronomy and one of our favorite topics, aliens, today, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, so I grew up in Pakistan and uh, in Karachi, so it's a big city. So this is different from being in Western Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, certainly. Um, and so I came here for my undergraduate and uh, I loved astronomy and that has, uh, you know, this story by the way has been told many times by me. Mm -hmm. And so you may hear it again and again, but I should mention that I got into astronomy because of Carl Sagan's cosmos yeah and it's sort of like you know it was shown in pakistan in 1984 i was in ninth grade and just that first episode just blew me away right and i was like okay i want to be an astronomer but it as it turns out it takes a long time after that so i can't <laughs> yeah, just watch the complete series cosmos and then be an astronomer uh, although a lot of people now think that you can actually watch youtube videos and you become an expert but anyway as it turns out that is not the case and um i came here and since I was coming from Pakistan and there aren't that many, there aren't that many astronomers in Pakistan or opportunities for astronomy. So I came here for computer science, uh -huh. or I should say, and here is my air quotes, computer science, because... Is that what you told your family? That is exactly what I told my family. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to be frank, I didn't know if I would like it or not, right? I mean, actual astronomy, research astronomy can be different, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was in New York, I was in Stony Brook, I did... Um, uh, and, and the other thing I found out was that in order to do astronomy, basically you have to do physics. Yeah. And so I did a double major, physics and astronomy, dropped computer science. Um, okay, so that was a little bit of a shock to my parents, mm. but, <laughs> but I did. I was too far away from them to do anything at that time. And uh, then I uh, went to graduate school to New Mexico. And my research uh, in my, for my PhD was as sort of like, you know, mainstream astronomy as possible, I looked for how stars form in spiral galaxies. And, uh, That's I, what your thesis was. That was my thesis, yeah. and, and I used telescopes in Chile, in New Mexico, in Arizona, in Hawaii, in the Spanish Canary Islands, so loved it. And then for my postdoc, I actually came here to the valley, and um, it was a, a joint position between, uh, between UMass Amherst and Smith College. So it was a fellowship of five college astronomy department fellowship. And they asked, to develop, uh, they asked me to develop a course on astronomy and public policy. And I had never been to a liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. I'd been to public schools. And in fact, I remember, and at that time, I don't know if it was Google or Yahoo, maybe, or whatever it was, search engine. Ask, ask Jeeves? I have to. I actually had to literally search, for, what is a liberal arts college? Yeah. Because in Pakistan, we're not familiar with that. And here I wasn't. And I was in astronomy department. I mean, we didn't want to talk to physicists. Like, you know, when I was in grad school, <laughs> like, hey, we are astronomers. We don't talk to anybody outside our field. And so being in liberal arts college, being at Smith, uh, that was life changing because suddenly you're talking to people who are like really interested in other fields. And and that led to my interest in uh, sort of like interdisciplinary work and just fortunate uh, that when I finished, I was four years I was at Smith and UMass, uh, that I got a position at Hampshire College. Uh, and that position was an endowed position, very broad. It was like integrated science and humanities. And that allowed me to work on sort of like, you know, teach courses 
there are uh, don't follow a specific sort of like you know discipline. And uh, I developed a course called Aliens: Close Encounters of a Multidisciplinary Kind, <laughs> where we talk about sort of like all different aspects of how people think about aliens from history because people have been claiming making claims about ufos to religion because there are uh, some people who believe sort of like in you know, ufo religion ufo abductions and also search for life in the universe uh, but my research moved more in the direction of science and society and a lot of my work um, was in or is in how um, especially in muslim societies how people think about modern science and i used biological evolution as sort of like, you know, as a probe to think about these things. But astronomy has always stayed close. I've uh, been connected with you as well in terms of popular astronomy. Uh, I've been connected with Pakistan as well in terms of popular astronomy. You're like the Carl Sagan of Pakistan right now in some ways because you have like a, a web series in Urdu that is communicating science in the same and, and astronomy in the same way that Carl Sagan was doing it in English and that you saw in Karachi in the 80s. Well, that's very uh, kind of you. But yes, I mean, I mean, I do create uh, these videos. And one of the goals of those videos is precisely that, that I actually never met Carl Sagan in person. And to me, that's a little puzzling that the most influential person in many ways on my life, like who completely changed my direction, and I'm talking to you right now, because of that first episode of Cosmos that I watched in 1984, but I never met that person. He, he was just on television. Mm -hmm. To me, that is actually a perplexing thing, a puzzling thing. And so I started creating these videos to a certain degree with a little hope that Sagan did not belong to my culture. He looked different and I was privileged enough to understand a bit of English and so on and so forth. But a lot of people don't. And so they can see somebody who's like them and like, you know, they, hey, you know, he can do PhD. So can I kind of a yeah. thing. And uh, so that's we're sort of like yeah, um, create these videos and also we are also now broadening um, the same video aspect and we'll be we'll be creating actually videos for uh, in collaboration with International Astronomical Union the people that killed Pluto oh uh, yeah I know I, I cannot in those videos I don't think I'm collaborating with them I think I'll have to be careful I will have to censor myself because they I'm voted to kill Pluto as a, a, a union of astronomers saying with not without total just cause Pluto is smaller than our moon Right, it doesn't clear its own orbit of debris given its gravitational pull. I, I at least know that. Well, but hold on. But okay, this is a longer conversation <laughs> which we will have. But I should mention that in Fabulous Four One Three, yeah, Pluto is a planet. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we accept all different types that, that, of planets here in Western Massachusetts. That's the kind of inclusive area we live. Exactly. And so, and so, these videos are going to be in English. So, and 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 some of that focus is also going to be. Uh, a, a sort of like, you know, a, another topic which I think is crucial, it's important, and that is about how humans are going to space and settle in space. Mm -hmm. And that is a topic which things are happening. I mean, there are questions about moon base coming up. It's within the next decade. Things are going to happen on the moon, at least, like, you know, in, uh, in terms of human settlement or human presence, uh, bases probably. And then, of course, uh, potentially on Mars. But I don't think we are having enough conversations about the type of challenges it brings, the kind of ethical issues and moral issues that we ought to think about, uh, the kind of sort of like, you know, should, we, should billionaires sort of like set all the rules and coming from South Asia, we know actually the corporate aspect where it can lead from the British East India Company, which only wanted a little trading post, yeah, sort of right. like in the 18th century, and what happened after that. So, and, and again, I think it's a really crucial time because we are going to go to space or we are going to take those first steps at a permanent basis once, meaning to say, once we set up rules, uh, then the later expansion is probably going to be that I am, uh, personally, I'm an optimistic person, uh, and, and so I think sort of like, you no know, things get better. But on the other hand, regarding this aspect, I'm actually quite pessimist because I think the momentum and the idealism is missing. The momentum is in the direction of we are going to be doing in space what we have been doing on Earth. Colonization. 
kind and of Cold War and co- Cold War exactly and and sort of like purely sort of like you know unadulterated capitalism where like you know it's the for profits and not like New England public media no <laughs> exactly <laughs> come from the for profit world to the non profit world exactly and so so I mean that would be great like you know that if we can maintain and there are some good things that for example the only treaty that everybody agrees on or everybody signed up to regarding outer space was the outer space treaty which was in 1967 which is actually pretty idealistic but also a bit ambiguous i would love to have that idealism and somehow right now that type of thing is missing but i'm hoping that in this show we'll talk a lot about these things so that's another topic which from the astronomy perspective from the space perspective i really want to bring the human aspect the uh, the not the sort of the technical aspects i'm curious about sort of like the cultural societal factors that are going to impact that we ought to think about when we think about going to space i'm at the kitchen table in amherst of hampshire college and five college astronomer dr salman hamid who i lovingly call mr universe not because of his physique but you're not far off <laughs> and we love to talk about science and astronomy in particular and when you know there's a big meteor shower happening or maybe there is a, a meteor that's coming close to earth we'll talk about those sort of things anything that's going on in the sky and anything that you might have a question about we'd love to ask Mr. Universe our resident astronomer you can email us any questions or even send a voice memo to the fab413 at nepm.org and i wanted our first segment apart from just being in amherst in your lovely kitchen uh, not far from where you teach to have some sort of grounding in the 413 now i know from you that the big bang happened everywhere so we could talk about the big bang and still be talking about the 413 that's a topic for another discussion but it's fascinating one thing that has been the news lately is ufo's the united states with a an f22 i believe out of westfield shoots down a chinese balloon and then all of a sudden several days later all of these other ufo's are getting shot down over canada over the united states and aliens starts trending on twitter aliens is one of our favorite topics full disclosure i believe that aliens inter- uh, intelligent life or at least life must exist outside of this planet and i believe you believe that too but what you have taught me over the years is we have no evidence that that's true talk to me about our recent spate of ufo sightings and the discussion about aliens that very quickly came up after it well i mean it's a sad story mm-hmm. the reason is because i think if people can go on the archives of your previous uh, radio station uh, where we did this segment we talked a lot about how ufo's uh, the topic of ufo's has been covered in the news and i've been extremely critical especially of the coverage of the new york times because this modern i mean there was this 1947 there that roswell those are i consider the classic <laughs> aliens like you know those are cool yeah. <laughs> uh, and and for disclosure i've been to the roswell museum because mm-hmm. i was actually close to uh, my phd was 200 miles um, west of uh, roswell a coincidence <laughs> actually yes uh, but <laughs> but um uh, but the recent stuff started with a front page story uh, in 2017 in december of 2017 and which i remember monty you frantically texted me and you go like check out sort of like this online stuff because uh this was a big story about that there was a government program uh and it was an exposé uh that had been looking for uh basically ufo's uh, or at that time they started calling them uaps unidentified aerial phenomena and the program that they mentioned had ended that ended in i think 2011 or 2012 and but the story was looked as somebody has come out and that said like you know that the government had investigated it and there were some footage and there's always some footage like you know of some flying things that some navy pilots had seen that was from 2003 and four i think or something like that and uh, i remember talking to you about that and i was also excited partly because if we do find aliens and i really hope we do uh, so let let me let me be very clear this would be a really cool thing because that will what i think what people don't appreciate it is like you know that finding 
alien life and especially finding alien intelligence, even if we just find it, it, they don't even have to be here, that fundamentally alters a number of fields, academic fields in the way we think about. So for example, ubiquity of life, uh, how uh, sort of like, you know, philosoph philosophy about sort of like, you know, that theory of mind, how evolution happens, how we think about things, can tools sort of like, you know, technology, is it sort of like, you know, common in other places? So there are many, many, many areas of uh, uh, academia which would be fundamentally transformed if we find um, alien intelligence, let alone them being here. So, but you can do, and you can imagine, what if it was? And so that New York Times article was a great piece in that sense. You go like, maybe this is it. Because they claim they had technology that in a warehouse somewhere, but very shortly after that was on the print version of the front page of the Sunday Times, they had to make some retractions. No, not soon after, two years later. <laughs> And and so in, that and that galactic time. That's right. It, that particular thing was the one. I think I, I remember talking to you. I was like, look, these flying things, like you know, pilots and stuff like that. That's fine. If people mistake things. That's not a big deal. But it actually made a claim that they have alien artifacts. And one of the persons who was quoted in it by saying, um, who actually used to, I think he's the one who used to work for CIA a long time ago. He claimed that this was like. Uh, giving uh, the stuff that we have is the analogy would be giving Leonardo da Vinci a garage opener. Look how it's going to be. And I remember then I was like, look, this is a game changer because it's on the front page of the New York Times. They are making claims of actual artifacts. They made claims that they were buildings had to be modified to house these things. I was like, whoa. And I also believed, because I'm a believer, I also <laughs> believed that New York Times, if it is, especially if it's a front page story on a topic like this, would actually have seen those things, check those things. I mean, you cannot just report it, or at least I thought you cannot just report it <laughs> like that. As it turns out, they had not seen those things. And two years later, in the middle of another UFO article, and since then, New York Times actually has been publishing many, many UFO uh, articles, because there also was one article that said, it was like one of their most read stories. And unfortunately, this is where the business side of it comes in, uh, potentially. But two years after this thing, there was another UFO story. And in the middle of it, there was just one sentence. And then they said that the earlier claims of artifacts turned out to be human made in the lab. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and to me, the question was, wait a minute. But that was the main thing. That was the most important thing. And to just put it there, but by that time, as you say, sort of like, you know, the horse had left the barn. Yeah. You had, uh, because of that article, Congress held hearings. Because Congress held hearings, it was in the New York Times. And because of congressional directive, Congress then directed that, hey, what do we know about it? Okay, who do we ask? Department of Defense. So then the Pentagon, the intelligence community, they had to produce a report because it was mandated. Now you have a intelligence community and that is also a news. So here is a case in some ways where in my mind, a whole mythology got created. And where you have, and, and it also got framed into national security. So this is something that we come back to it today with the balloons and all of that stuff, because the framing was, well, if it's not aliens, well, we still have to know what it is. It immediately got framed in just in case as a national security context. So even if you are a doubter, oh, what if you are missing some in some sort of like advanced Chinese or Russian technology, right? Oh, no, no, so we have to do that, right? So it created that, and over the period of time, over the last couple of years, this UFO narrative, even though pretty much most of the, I would say 99% of the scientists, with the exception of Avi Loeb yeah. at Harvard, who has been claiming about these kind of things, but he hasn't said about this particular UFO aspects, but in general, people who actually look for alien signatures, they actually haven't come out and said, this is it. Let's pull back. Let's focus on this because we've been looking for SETI or we've been looking for life on Mars. This is a much bigger thing. Let's focus on that. This hasn't happened. 
we're still sending spacecraft to Mars to go through the dirt to hopefully find a dead bacteria or something like that. That is where the actual research is being done. So all of the hoopla surrounding what these things that are unidentified, potentially flying, and potentially objects, better described as unidentified aerial phenomena, things in the sky, uh, to jump to aliens is is bold. And Carl Sagan had a, 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 a quote that you probably remember much better than I do about these bold claims must have. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, to bring this back to the 413, there is a monument in Sheffield, Massachusetts, signed off by Governor Charlie Baker that indicates that there was an alien encounter in Sheffield, right near the covered bridge in 1969. And that's what's grounding it, not just in the fact that 413 is part of the Big Bang and all astronomy, we're a planet, we can really talk about whatever we want, but Sheffield, Massachusetts is the home of an extraordinary claim about aliens. Right. And and by the way, this is before the 2017 article in the New York Times. So they were ahead of times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this was interesting because uh, and I think we also uh, m- talked about it a little bit way back when it happened, because the gra- the interesting aspect about this story is that the Great Barrington Historical Society gave it its blessing. They actually officially recognized this, ex- I should say, experience or sighting. Uh, which was seen apparently by multiple people. Uh, the central character in here is Tom Reed, uh, who was six years old at that time. And uh, But he wasn't the only one. Other people also saw it. There was apparently, there was also uh, people some talk to on the radio. They called on the radio to talk about it. There was and a small radio station there. People started calling in right calling away. Calling in, yeah. and, and they also mentioned. So There's a great piece from WGBH, our parent company, about about this very uh, thing. Ah, okay, all right, great. So so this is one of those things that I want to differentiate between people believing they saw something versus, or, or people believing that they saw an alien spacecraft or aliens versus are there aliens out there or are there spacecrafts that are visiting the Earth? I think people do believe that they actually see things. And in fact, that happens more often than not. And in fact, it's actually quite common when you look up and sort of like, you know, especially in case if you're not familiar with, uh, there are spy things or there are new types of things, but also oftentimes it's planet Venus. People actually don't realize how bright uh, planet Venus is. Uh, I was just reading uh, recently, there was an incident uh, at the end of the World War II as well uh, in 1945, where actually uh, on one of the U.S. naval ships, they actually said like, you know, they thought that it was a Japanese balloon, talking about balloons, like, you know, or some Japanese spacecraft uh, that was there and it, it was being sort of, con- they were considering shooting it down, whereas the person said, actually, I think it's planet, it's Venus. So <laughs> Don't try to shoot down Venus. Right, so, but this is one of those things that if you are in a little bit of a mode of hysteria, like, you know, or a little bit of things sort of like, oh, my goodness, what is going on? Then you start seeing other things and, and it can impact. So September... Of twenty uh, in, of nineteen sixty nine, when this UFO incident happened, this was a f- few months after moon landing. So you can imagine sort of like you know that aspect uh, coming in um, as well. So the common themes in these type of things is about, and this was also mentioned with the Great Barrington Historical Society that said like you know that it was credible, and a lot of people saw that. And we believe it, that this actually happened. Um, and, uh, and so all I would say is that pretty much nobody who makes UFO claims or people who believe in that, they say, well, this is not credible, but it happened. I mean, you know, everybody actually says that, including Navy pilots that saw sort of like, you know, something in the sky, they recorded something in the sky. But that is not how science works. That is not enough especially for something, a claim as big as aliens, to say, this is it, right? So what is needed for that? And, and you can be Einstein. Well, there was an Einstein who was wrong about certain things, right? So you can be anybody. You, so, and that is one of the powerful things about science is that you can be a Nobel laureate and you come out and say, you know, X, 
you don't have to. Or maybe Q. Or Q. You don't have, that's right. (laughs) You don't have to accept it. And we are trained in that context to a certain degree that if it's a bigger claim, you actually challenge that. Like, you know, and it doesn't matter who makes that claim. And um, Stephen Hawking has been wrong about certain things. Einstein has been wrong about certain things. And so it doesn't, it's not enough that the people who are making the claim are credible. Because they may not be lying, but they may be mistaken. And And again, and in order to show that is something there, it's not like, you know, that requires the, I mean, just imagine about, we're talking about Mars and microbes. You don't just say, oh, I don't know, this looks kind of like a microbe, why not it? Because I want to believe in it. I mean, it's not that scientists don't want to believe that there is life, but we want to be sure that, especially because if you want to believe in it, you have to be even more skeptical. You are not being fooled. There is that fine line, Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, between faith and science. And part of the interdisciplinary things that you teach have to do with those perspectives. And we're not trying to say that this person in 1969 didn't see something, that those people in Sheffield didn't see something. All you're saying from the scientific perspective is that's great you had an experience maybe there's a monument there perhaps don't get the governor to sign off that it was aliens because that becomes problematic don't get the historical society to sign off to say it was aliens because there's no proof that it was aliens there's a claim people have have all sorts of claims about things that they see things that they believe from a religious perspective or not all that's well and good that's not science right and and i think the there, I mean, and the monument, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, has been removed uh, from it. Or at least moved off of what was state property. I right. Think, yeah. And so uh, I, th- I think the uh, here the onus is on the, uh, the issue is more the Great Barrington Historical Society confirming that the experience, not the experience was real, but they, what they saw, the claim was true. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think there is a distinction. And I think that's very important because... People can have also have a meaning out of it, uh, and uh, and I teach about alien abductions and people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. They actually really believe that it's true, and also uh, and 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 they have a lot of meaning attached to it. And I think that is important to acknowledge that, and and I think if you say whether that happened, it depends upon what are you talking about. Was the did the experience happen? And I would say absolutely. That is true, but was that so? But there is a separate question. If you say, but were there aliens that abducted these uh, people from Earth, and the experience was related to that? Well, that's a different question, and for which we don't have enough evidence, or we don't have evidence for that. There are alternative explanations that are simpler because we know that people can have these kind of sleep paralysis or other types of things. So in the same way. If somebody thinks that there is, there are sort of like, you know, these alien spacecrafts out there in night, night sky, do people believe that? Yes. Do people genuinely think they are seeing alien spacecrafts? Yes. But there is a separate question. Are those things alien spacecrafts? And for that, the evidence has to be stronger, more. Eyewitness testimony is actually not good enough in science. For that, you need better evidence, uh, not simply, I saw it, I believed it, and we are credible, a bunch of people are credible. These are the kind of conversations we're going to continue to have here on the show. If you have a question for our resident astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, about the breadth and depth of all things astronomy, or the Cold War brewing between the United States and China on the moon, or Chinese spy balloons, or Russia versus the U.S., or any of those things, this is what we love to talk about. Or science fiction films. Right. Or like, you yes. know, or former president of the Amher Cinema right here. Right. And yeah. so, yeah, I, l- I love films and sort of like, you know, especially that tackle, uh, in some ways, these type of questions. Uh, I followed um, 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 For All Mankind, which was on Apple TV. Of course, like, you know, there are so many streaming services. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so there are all these places where sort of like, you know, that allows us to think. So that, I think that could cover too. Send us your questions and we'll ask them on a future show thefab413 at nepm.org. Thank you, Mr. Universe. Thank you very much.